Okay, so this whole triumphant return to the moon thing is not going so smoothly right now. And as tempting as it is to just be cynical and say that we all knew this was coming or whatever else, I'll be honest, as someone who has been closely following this story for a couple of years now, I am genuinely surprised that Artemis 1 is not on its way to the moon at the time of writing this. It's fun to be a critic and talk about how lame and old the SLS technology is, and we've definitely indulged in plenty of that. But as unsurprising as this rocket may be, we at least thought that it would work. And so far, at least, it does not work. And that's a problem. For NASA, that is. This could very well be the best thing that has ever happened for SpaceX. We've all kind of known for a while now, at least, since we saw the first full stack of Starship and Super Heavy Booster, that clearly this rocket would be a much better option for going to the moon than the SLS. It's bigger, more powerful, reusable, it isn't fueled by the lightest and therefore most leakable element in the known universe. But at the same time, SpaceX is a private company, and NASA is their single biggest customer. They already have a giant contract to provide a Starship moon lander. So it wouldn't exactly be good business practice for them to openly discuss trashing the SLS and replacing it flat out with a Starship like so many of us on YouTube, have already done many times over. But if SLS doesn't work, or at the very least proves itself to be wildly unsustainable, then, all of a sudden, it becomes an awful lot less taboo for SpaceX to offer up the services of their very own gigantic interstellar rocket as a replacement. In that case, they wouldn't be the usurpers anymore, they'd be the heroes who saved the Artemis program from ruin. Wouldn't that be nice? Let's talk about it. This is the Space Race. So again, we'd kind of been expecting that after 11 years of development and $20 billion spent, that SLS would at least be able to get its payload into orbit without this infuriating cycle of finding problems and then fixing them and then finding more problems and fixing them and then finding even more problems and then fixing them and then coming back to the old problem that we thought we fixed and finding out that it remains a problem that needs to be fixed again. That's definitely not sustainable. We already know that the projected cost of an Artemis mission launch on the SLS is around $2 billion. And I wonder if that quote included several months worth of testing and troubleshooting and moving the rocket back and forth and back and forth between the assembly building and the launch pad. If there's anything inherently wrong with the SLS design, then it's not getting fixed anytime soon. In an article by NASA Spaceflight published in August, they report that the SLS core stage for Artemis II is already in the final assembly process at Boeing's manufacturing facility in New Orleans. The structural assembly of the core stage for Artemis III is already complete on four out of five main elements, and the engine structure for Artemis IV has already been built. We know that Boeing is contracted to provide 10 SLS core stages to NASA, and that contract has the option for 10 more after that, which is actually a bit mind-boggling when you really stop to think about it. Even at a launch cadence of one per year, which is optimistic at best for SLS, that means NASA has no plan to change or even significantly upgrade this rocket design for 20 years at least. One thing that NASA really prides themselves on is that SLS components are constructed all across America and then brought together at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The core stage is so big that it has to be floated in on a barge after being constructed in Louisiana and tested at Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. The RS-25 engines are coming from Aerojet Rocketdyne in California. The engines that they are using for the first few SLS flights are leftovers from the shuttle program. But Aerojet Rocketdyne has already restarted production of the engines for future SLS launches. The two side boosters are built by Northrop Grumman in Utah and have to be transported to Florida on freight trains. Anyway, 
The point being that decades worth of manufacturing work has been set into motion by the SLS and Artemis program before even one successful test has been completed, which kind of seems insane, right? It feels wrong. Also, just wanted to let you know about our Discord server. We've got over 1,500 members and host regular live watch parties within the community. We have some big events coming up for the first Starship launch, Artemis launch, and Tesla AI day. So if you aren't already, join our Discord server using the link in the description. I went back to an interview that former NASA Deputy Director Lori Garver did for her book launch last month. The book, Escaping Gravity, is a kind of tell-all, behind-the-scenes look at the inner workings of NASA from 2009 to 2013. And coincidentally, the SLS arrived right in the middle of that time frame. When asked if she could explain why SLS is taking so long, Garver said this, quote, To me, it was clearly going to take a long time because they took finicky, expensive programs that couldn't fly very often, stacked them together differently, and said, now, all of a sudden, it's going to be cheap and easy. The shuttle was supposed to fly 40 or 50 times a year, and at its max, it never got close. Typically, it was four or five. So yeah, we've flown them before, but they've proven to be problematic and challenging. This is one of the things that boggled my mind. What about it was going to change? I attribute it to this sort of groupthink, the contractors and the self-licking ice cream cone, end quote. So that kind of gets you thinking. Seeing what we've now seen over the past week, does NASA actually, like genuinely expect SLS to work? Is the Artemis program really about going back to the moon? Or is this all just some big scheme to keep America's legacy aerospace companies in business for as long as possible? Do they even care about going to the moon? Or are they just interested in getting paid as much as possible before the bubble bursts? I found another interview with a former NASA leader. This is Charles Bolden, who was chief administrator at NASA from 2009 to 2017. This is what he told Politico in September 2020. Quote, SLS will go away. It could go away during a Biden administration or a next Trump administration, because at some point, commercial entities are going to catch up. They are really going to build a heavy lift launch vehicle, sort of like SLS, that they will be able to fly for a much cheaper price than NASA can do with SLS. That's just the way it works." End quote. Six months after he said that, in March 2021, SpaceX successfully landed a Starship prototype for the first time and immediately began development of the Super Heavy Booster and an orbital launch candidate. SpaceX has built eight Super Heavy Booster prototypes in less than two years and 25 starships in less than three years. As of today, the latest iterations of that ship and booster are deep into static fire engine testing and final preparations for a launch attempt. SpaceX is targeting that first launch attempt to happen sometime before the end of this year. It's very difficult to gauge SpaceX timelines because Elon Musk is now famous for overestimating what his companies are actually capable of doing in a set time frame. He does this with Tesla, Neuralink, Boring Company, and SpaceX. He runs on Elon time. But we can see progress at Boca Chica. We see the engines firing. We see the new construction happening. If Starship works, then SpaceX is targeting a launch cadence of once per month in the first stage to deploy their second generation Starlink network. And then, if that all goes well, Starship will replace the Falcon 9 as the company's primary launch vehicle. And Falcon is currently flying something like once every five days on average. So that is a lot of Starship launches, and Elon expects the cost per launch to come down to just $10 million within three years. So even if the SLS does overcome these early stage hurdles and goes on to work exactly as it was intended, which at this point we can pretty confidently say that it won't, but even if it did, SLS is going to look pretty silly launching once a year at $2 billion a pop when it's sitting next to Starship. 
SpaceX is literally building a new Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center right next door to SLS. And at that point, like Charles Bolden said, SLS will go away. That's just the way it works. So, like we said, it's really a best-case scenario for SpaceX and kind of the rest of us. If the natural order of the world simply shifts favor away from SLS and onto the Starship, the senior executives at Boeing, Grumman, and Aerojet will have pocketed more than enough money to live out the rest of their lives in luxury. There is going to be plenty of room in the future at SpaceX and Blue Origin and Rocket Lab and others to give the talented engineers and production workers of the old aerospace world a new place to call home where they can build stuff that actually works and goes to space on a regular basis. And then the Artemis program isn't kneecapped by a rocket system that has to be rebuilt from scratch every single launch. So instead of being limited in going to the moon once a year, Starship can actually get us there basically anytime we want. We can go once a week. That's the kind of thing that Starship is built for. It's designed to fly to Mars and back, really. So going to the moon is no sweat. And this is going to be very important once competing interests like China get the ability to launch their own rockets to the moon. China is not far away from being able to match SLS, and we've seen them with a proven track record of developing and launching new rocket designs in the past decade. They've churned out so many variations of the Long March that it's hard to keep up. They're on Long March 8 right now. Long March 9 is coming, and that's the one that will far exceed the SLS if it works out according to the Chinese plan. But that's not to say that Starship is a sure bet either. Getting this humongous thing into orbit is going to be a major feat. Then they've got to successfully land it by catching the rocket stages with a giant robot claw. Then they've got to figure out how to refill the Starship in Earth orbit to give it enough oxidizer to even reach the moon. And then they've got to prove that they can do all of those things safely enough that we can start flying human beings there. So... I guess all that we can say is that there is still a long and complicated road to travel before we can really start expanding our human society into space. As much as we all wanted to think that it would have gotten easier by now, it's actually managed to get much more complicated. And that sucks. We have problems. But we also have some really great answers that have the potential to fulfill all of those science fiction dreams that we grew up with. A city on the moon exploring the planet Mars. These things can happen. Or can they? What do you think is going to be the fate of SLS? Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.